Hello, and welcome to High Rise Plumbing Design. This is High Rise Plumbing Design Online, sponsored by UCLA Extension University. My name is David DeBoard. I'll be your instructor. You can contact me through david.aspie at gmail.com or you can call myself if you need to. Our course will explore basic high-rise plumbing system design for high-rise buildings and will include components and systems typically found in these buildings and we'll try to give you some less conventional approaches along the way. We'll talk about sanitary waste and vent stacks, cold water systems, hot water systems, hot water research, some equipment, lead and sustainability considerations, and some other things. Your objective is to be a successful learner, and this will mean that you will be able to identify several existing high-rise buildings, determine what constitutes a high-rise building, be able to determine the number of water supply zones, size uh, booster pump system for a building, and also design a hot water supply system for a high-rise building. Among to get started, you should have already done this, but go to the syllabus area, read the entire syllabus. You'll find all course materials organized by week behind the weekly materials button. Then go to the discussion board and find the first messages from me. There might be a couple. Uh, please reply and introduce yourself. And if you could post a brief, a brief bio, great. Hello team. Again, I am David DeBoard and I have over 40 years experience. Worked on all kinds of buildings, thousands of them, including Kingdom Tower, some involvement, and it is currently under redesign, but I am not at that firm any longer. It will be one kilometer high. That's almost two Sears Towers on top of each other. I currently serve as Vice President Legislative for the American Society of Plumbing Engineers at the society level and I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at IIT. I've been teaching there for about six years and I've been doing different kinds of presentations for over 10 around the country and also out of the country once in a while like Bogota, Colombia and among other things I'm a member of a lot of different organizations including ILFI, IATMO, ASCS, ARCSA, GHBC, and I'm on committees for IATMO, ICC, and ASP on a level. I live in Chicago where I've been for 38 years. You can contact me with this information. I don't expect you'll be calling me regularly, but if you need to, you can. Chicago has some pretty tall buildings and some of them would be John Hancock Center, Aon Center, Trump Tower, the Sears Tower, which is now called Willis Tower, and a couple that were proposed but not built yet, Fordham Spire and Tall Tower. Fordham Spire right now is just a hole in the ground because the financing fell through a few years ago, and we're yet to see what will happen with that. But we're looking at 2,000 feet high for the last two that we mentioned that is very tall. Sears Tower was the tallest building in the world then and uh, the honors were given to Petronas Towers and now we've gone way beyond that. Our planet is covered in a tremendous variety of high-rise structures globally and they come in different shapes and sizes. Here's my tip of the week. The only perfect project and let's look at one. This is a perfect project. And why is it? What makes a project perfect? It is the one that does not get built because there are no mistakes, no FRs, no FRFIs, no extras, no one was hurt. As long as you get paid, it was perfect. 
Welcome to the world of high-rise plumbing engineering. We have taken on new heights with these buildings and I like to call them the tallest building of the world of the week because there are so many of them reaching so high and most of them are in Asia right now but they are resplendent and they're everywhere. The tallest that I know of under development right now is Kingdom Tower in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and it's still in the design phase, being redesigned, but it's a full kilometer high. This requires a lot of ingenuity to cover a vast array of engineering challenges, not only structural, but HVAC, plumbing, everything. I like to think of this as an adventure. Welcome to our adventure. So what is a high-rise building? Depends. A building of seven stories or more in height is commonly considered as a high-rise structure, but there are many different variations with this definition, and you have to authority that's making this determination. For example, one popular list of definitions would be a low-rise is one to three stories, mid-rise four to eleven, high-rise twelve to thirty-nine skyscraper more than 40 stories and super tall varies tremendously normally that would be over a hundred stories but it depends again on the authority. some authorities and organizations consider a structure of nine stories or more to be sometimes it's by height according to many building codes such as NFPA 101 NFPA 5000, International Building Code, and the Uniform Building Code, the Standard Building Code, there are three elements of a high-rise that are generally common to many definitions. 75 feet in height above grade, highest occupied floor level, and the lowest level of fire department access. According to NFPA 5000, the 2003 edition, the high-rise building is a building greater than 75 feet in height where the building height is measured from the lowest level of fire department vehicle access to the floor of the highest occupiable story. Empress, which is a provider of building data and construction projects worldwide, defines high-rise as a building being a structure whose architectural height is between 35 and 100 meters. Structure is automatically listed as high-rise when it has a minimum of 12 floors whether or not the height is known. If it has fewer than 40 floors and the height is unknown, it also classi is classified automatically as a high-rise. The International Building Code considers high-rise to be 75 feet to 450 feet. Everything above 450 feet is categorized separately as a super high-rise. Generally, a building of 80 feet in height constitutes a high-rise classification, but fire codes and authorities such as NFPA consider 75 feet to be a high-rise. Some jurisdictions will consider the limit to be as high as their tallest ladder carrying fire truck, which could be four to six stories. That's not very tall at all based on you know these other projects that we're looking at. The actual legal definition is decidedly more important for fire protection considerations than it is for plumbing. For our purposes, we can assume a high rise to be a tall building. We will look at how tall they need to be, but we will work under the premise that it's at least 75 feet to 80 feet in height. We'll find that this is about the limits of a single zone of delivering domestic water to fixtures. We will also see that there is a need for relief vents on stacks of 10 branch intervals. As always, we must verify the definition as well as how that definition brings in restrictions and additional requirements based on the authority having jurisdiction for that project prior to there are a wide variety of high-rise building occupancies. Plumbing systems may generally consist of the same basic components, but different occupancies may require some different considerations. 
plumbing systems for example the use of these occupancy types vary greatly in terms of occupant loads operating times and purpose office buildings will not have nearly the hot water usage that you would hotel or a condo building high-rise office buildings usually consist of a structure that is considered core and shell construction that indicates that the, the majority of the spaces within the building are going to be used by various tenants at the beginning of the project, even upon completion. These tenants may cover a full gamut of occupants. Could be a conglomeration of various tenants, including insurance offices, investment firms, lawyers, could be architectural and engineering firms, public service operations, etc. Some of the space may include retail spaces and food service, normally at the ground level, sometimes it's at the high level, or sometimes in the middle. Sometimes the top of the high-rise building may include entertainment and or food service. It's a nice place to put a restaurant. Hotels present a unique group of challenges to us as plumbing engineers. These considerations include quantities of hot water required at various times of day, due to a high percentage of simultaneous users. Don't know where the music came from. The hot water presents other considerations not present in an office building. There will usually be many more water risers which will necessi necessitate extra consideration of hot water recirculation requirements and the need for a third party balancing report. Make sure you get the report, make sure that it looks like it's valid. Someone should be witnessing the procedure, especially if you have a commissioning contract. Hotels are often large often include large food service facilities. These facilities require large quantities of hot water, but also grease interceptors, usually laundry facilities, they might have swimming pools and other special needs. They might also contain large parking facilities. They would require oil separators probably. Concerns. Condo and apartment buildings are different. Residential high-rise are somewhat similar to high-rise hotels, but they have some significant differences. One of the most significant Differences lies in the hot water usage profiles. Both types of occupancies have large peak hot water demands but are still very different. We'll discuss these load profiles in more detail under the hot water section. Then we have mixed use buildings. So they can be just like they sound, mixed use. So they might have a variety of occupants. It could have some office, some retail, and some residential. It's common. With the taller buildings, it's almost always going to be some kind of mixed use. This would naturally lead to presume that we must consider many different aspects of these anticipated occupancies so that we can provide all the services that all of them need. Entities may require specific needs. High-rise buildings are all about the pressure. Water has a personal rule that it holds dear. Water seeks its own level. If we wanted to do something contrary to this, we have to exert some pressure of some kind to the water or let gravity work for us. We have to do something. Here's an example of equilibrium of static pressure. Notice that the tanks are open to the atmosphere. There's a pipe between them. The, at the top we see the two tanks are at the same level. There's no flow in the pipe that connects them. As one tank on the right has a higher level, there will be flow toward the lower level. Just like everything else in nature, it flows from more to less. Higher temperature to lower temperature. Higher pressure to lower pressure. And then you see on the bottom, you see that there's no flow because equilibrium has been reached. Gravity tends to support this rule. Gravity sometimes works against us, but it can also be used 
for our own purposes of distributing water or wastewater which is almost always under gravity. Sanitary waste and storm systems rely on gravity whenever physically possible. Relentless. Static pressure at atmospheric pressure with no outside pressure added or sub subtracted. Pressure equals depth times density. Water has a density of 62.42 pounds per cubic foot at normal atmospheric temperatures. It varies depending on the temperature. If this is one foot high, it would exert a pressure of 62.42 pounds per square One square foot is 144 square inches, so if we divide 62.42 by 144, we get 0.43333 pounds per square inch per foot. So static is, for one foot high, a column of water will exert a pressure of 0.433 psi. This is called static pressure. It is a result of the force of gravity applied to that column of water, one square inch by one foot high. Gravity is relentless and considered to be constant, although gravitational fields vary slightly. That's not going to affect our purposes here. The density of water also varies depending on the temperature. It's basically considered to be non-compressible, and so atmospheric pressures have little or no effect on its density, but uh, temperature can. But for our normal atmospheric temperatures, we don't have to be concerned about that. We'll look at all of these things later. Do you have any questions? If so, please use the forum or email. Any more questions? Okay, we have some homework. So homework and other assignments will be listed on Blackboard. Please review the homework policy statements that I have placed on Blackboard. Let me know if you have any questions or comments regarding these requirements. I probably put too much stuff under week one, but please take a look at all the additional reading materials, the videos that I have links to, and etc. I'm looking forward to working with you and I know that you're going to enjoy this class and the online learning process. Email me if you have any questions. There's also a forum for questions about the course. I will make every attempt to respond within 24 to 40 hours. If you have any technical questions, don't call me. Please feel free to call or contact technical support. You can also contact me through the email feature in this class. In this class. I hope you have a great learning experience. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to our adventure.